everyone. Uh, happy to be speaking here and happy to, that all of you uh, are here. Uh, I'm Anna. I work at Isovalent on all observability things uh, related to networking and security use cases. Um, yeah, I'm a software engineer uh, building solutions uh, on top of EPF for network and security visibility. Uh, and today I will talk about uh, using eBPF for observability, um, what are common issues with this, and uh, show you some examples how um, we see it com eBPF being commonly used for observability uh, and uh, yeah, common use cases we, we see. It. So uh, eBPF uh, is present in observability space for quite a while. Um, and it promises a lot. Uh, it, it promises uh, that, we will, we, that we will get no instrumentation uh, observability. We just drop in something and uh, magically get observability for our applications. It promises complete visibility because eBPF is running in the kernel. Um, it sees all the applications running on the machine. Uh, especially important in uh, environments like Kubernetes when uh, applications can be just scheduled anywhere um, and uh, application developers don't generally need to think about where they are running, uh, but eBPF uh, programs still uh, can see them. Uh, eBPF also promises low overhead of, um, of the visibility we are getting. Um, and reliability. And reliability is a part that's, uh, in my opinion, a bit underappreciated. Um, because eBPF programs are verified, uh, they, uh, to run in a kernel, they have to be checked that they are uh, safe to run. Um, it means that they are, they are pretty reliable. They are not bug free, of course, but they are more reliable than most software done in write. And uh, for all of these things, like uh, for, to get uh, observability with no instrumentations, there are other approaches, like we can install some, um, some agents, we can inject some sidecars, but uh, I'm sure many of us have experienced this dreadful incident that uh, for example, affected connectivity between sidecar and an application, and then when we need data the most, we lose them. Um, with eBPF, because programs are running in the kernel, um, we, in general, they just stay there and run. Uh, they don't cause that, that many issues as uh, user space um, agents or sidecars that can crash. Uh, so they uh, add this extra layer of reliability. So these are all things that uh, EBPF promises us for observability, uh, how it works. Uh, I assume not uh, everybody is familiar. Uh, so EBPF is here for a while, but uh, it's most of us use it indirectly and not really writing EBPF code. So a uh, short uh, overview of how it works. Um, we have a user space agent. Uh, yeah, so usually there is some, um, some sort of agent that loads eBPF programs. Um, then eBPF programs load, um, are verified by the verifier. Verifier is a very interesting piece of software that I'm not gonna go into, but it essentially checks that programs are safe to, are safe to run, but they, uh, won't use all memory, won't crash the machine, things like that. Uh, then the programs are uh, just in time compiled. Um, so this piece provides us a minimal overhead because everything is, um, is just running um, in the kernel and is compiled uh, efficiently. And then uh, the BPF program is hooked. Uh, it is hooked to, uh, on this picture, it's uh, an example syscall, but it doesn't have to be syscall. There are many different hook points. Uh, it's hooked somewhere, and then it runs on every execution of this hook point. And this is the bit that gives us this complete visibility, because uh, the eBPA program doesn't care 
what triggered this hook point. Uh, we have applications um, running in written in many languages, um, maintained by many different teams. Uh, no matter what language the application is written in, the hook point will be executed. Um, yeah, and there's no way for application to, to stop it. Okay, uh, I was talking about the hook points, so what they are. Uh, here you have a sneak peek of a tool that uh, I'm um, at the moment working on, Tetragon. Uh, so this is an uh, example of Tetragon configuration and a tracing policy. Uh, which is pretty low level configuration where you can define which hook points exactly you want to hook into uh, and which ones you want to observe. Uh, we have k-probes. K-probes are kernel probes which are any kernel functions practically. Uh, yeah, essentially you can uh, hook into any uh, kernel function. Uh, there are k-red probes which are like k-probes, but executed on uh, the return of the function, not uh, when it starts. Um, very often in observability context, we use both k-probes and k-red probes because we, we usually want to understand what uh, the function was doing, what it did exactly, and not only that it executed. Uh, there are trace points which are like, uh, like k-probes, but uh, static, so a bit more stable. Uh, and there are also u-probes and u-red probes. Um, so like k-probes again, but user, uh, user space, user level uh, probes when we hook, can hook into um, like user application symbols. Uh, also very commonly used uh, in observability. I don't have them in this example, but uh, very commonly used, for example, for um, um, automated uh, auto instrumentation for distributed tracing. All right, um, so yeah, uh, now um, this uh, is promising us a lot, but you might now think how this can actually help us with observability because, uh, well, it's, it's cool that we can see like what kernel is doing, but this is not what we exactly would call observability. Um, what, what actually we? would call observability then. Uh, so in the past, uh, like at this point, uh, we would quote somebody who has some smart things to say about it. These days we are asking ChatGPT for things like that. So I did this. Um, so this is what ChatGPT told me, what, what is observability? Um, observability is the capability to inspect and understand a system state based on its external outputs, such as logs, metrics, and traces. It involves collecting and analyzing these data points to diagnose issues, optimize performance, and ensure that systems reliability. Observability provides deep insights into the system, facilitating proactive problem solving and improving overall system understanding. Okay, this, this sounds like reasonable to me, not, not different <laughs> from, from uh, what I actually hearing from humans. Um, the key points are that uh, there is a system that exposes some data. Um, logs, metrics, traces, or other data, but there is some data exposed by the system. We are collecting this data in some database and then we are expecting that this data will allow, will let us understand the system. So we, without touching the system, we, we just need to query the data. Um, probably we need some query language, some visualization maybe, but the goal is to understand um, the system uh, for whatever we are doing. All right. And now, um, if we think back about uh, what we are doing with EBPF, we are hooking to some kernel functions or some uh, U-probes, whatever. Um, how does it actually help us understand the system? The fact that uh, well, some kernel functions are executing, yeah, of course they are executing, they are doing something, but uh, this is something happening in the kernel. What, uh, and we want to understand not the kernel, but the, the whole system, um, our applications and the, the, the wider system. So um, in my opinion, the two key things to, uh, to really uh, ensure system observability uh, is 
context and correlation. Um, what, what we really need in an observability tool is uh, we need context. We need to have this user context to understand uh, not only that kernel is doing something, but also understand, um, understand it in the context of uh, user requests of um, some business application, uh, whatever the application is, is doing. And we need correlation uh, because the system is doing so much that if, if we just have some individual events about what, what is going on, then still uh, understanding the system from these individual events would be very, very difficult because um, how to build full picture from, from all of them. Uh, and uh, one feature in, in, BP, in eBPF that really allows us to use it for, um, for observability and for anything else really, uh, BPF maps. BPF maps are like, uh, like a data store in BPF world. So wherever we would use a database, a cache, in BPF world, we use a BPF map. There are many different kinds of them, but they are like key value stores um, starting in kernel memory. They are used for uh, a few things. So first of all, this is, uh, they allow us to pass the high level context to kernel. So this is the bit that really allows us to build observability tool with eBPF, not only uh, just observe what the kernel is doing and inform user about it. We can pass this high level context, for example, from um, Kubernetes uh, metadata would be standard example or any sort of uh, business context, really. Uh, we can correlate between different events. So different eBPF programs can use the same map. Uh, and thanks to that, we can correlate, for example, between kprobe and kreprobe. This is what we do very often, but also uh, between completely different events like uh, a network event and a file event. Why not? We, we can correlate them to, to understand the full picture of what is going on. Um, and then uh, kind of basic usage of, uh, of BPF maps and fundamental to everything we do. We, we need to somehow pass the data from, uh, uh, from the kernel to the user. So uh, yeah, we, we use a BPF map for that too because both kernel and the user, uh, the, the agent, user space agent can uh, access it. Um, let's zoom in to this bit a little bit. So um, in general, in, in observability uh, tooling, there, we, we, there are two modes of how data is retrieved. Either we pull things or push things. Um, typically in Prometheus, for example, we pull metrics uh, from the targets, um, other, uh, other tools, uh, like for uh, pushing some, some events. So uh, two typical, uh, how we typically uh, transfer data between user space and kernel space, we uh, push events uh, through a ring buffer with the user space agent, and then the user space agent uh, has to keep with, with the ring buffer um, and, and just read this event. And uh, we can also pull metrics from, uh, from a map. Uh, I will dive into this uh, a little bit uh, later. All right, so um, the data problem. Uh, here we see, um, this is uh, a graph from recent survey from Grafana Labs about biggest concerns about observability. And uh, well, we're working on EVPF-based uh, you know, observability tooling, what I would like to say, see here is that the biggest concern is that uh, instrumentation is difficult and that we are like, bam, EVPF, no observability, no, no instrumentation and full observability or like uh, that the overhead is big and we are like, bam, EVPF, low overhead. But it, it doesn't look like that exactly. Uh, what, what we see here is that the biggest concern is cost, uh, and EBPF can help with this. Uh, all of these aspects I talked about uh, contribute to cost and can help to reduce cost. 
but cost is a complex thing. There are a million factors to it, and it's pretty hard to measure how, how we are actually affecting the, the cost of observability tooling uh, of the, the whole pipeline. Um, the next uh, biggest concerns are uh, complexity, originality, signal to noise ratio, and data retention time. Uh, so essentially, we, we see here a lot of things related to data to cardinality of data, um, how much of this data is signal, how much is noise that we need to somehow filter out to actually find the signal, uh, how much data can we actually store uh, to make troubleshooting possible, but still keep the cost reasonable. Um, the eBPF-based Observability tools produce different kinds of data. Um, here are a few, uh, tool, uh, few of these tools. Uh, Tetragon, which produces uh, events. Events by, by events, I mean like uh, locks, but st structured. So uh, yeah, essentially locks with with uh, with a schema. Mm. And they're just exported in JSON format uh, and metrics. Uh, there is Pixie, which uh, exports uh, metrics and profiles. There are a few other eBPF based providers, too, like Parka or uh, Pyroscope. Uh, there is recently, more recently released, Kafana Bela, which uh, provides metrics, too, and uh, trace spans. So it does um, auto instrumentation for distributed tracing and exports um, trace spans. Um, I, uh, currently, I work on, the, on Tetragon, uh, so I know it the most, so I will show a few examples from, from this one. Um, this is a graphic uh, describing Tetragon in, in more details. Uh, it was built as a security tool, uh, so, most, uh, so the main use cases are, are focused on security, but in reality, the, the core functionality uh, is pretty generic uh, loader of probes. So we can use it for a million different use cases from security domain, but also from uh, many other domains, because if we can load any K probe or U probe, then um, we can do whatever we, we want with, with events we, we are getting from it. Um, so here is the example uh, configuration uh, of, for Tetragon. Uh, Tetragon in, in general is configured um, with tracing policy CRD. And um, this example is um, a tracing policy for um, monitoring uh, file operations. Uh, now it, it it is pretty low level, and um, it's, uh, if you are wondering how, uh, you can see that it hooks into security file permission K-probe. Um, if you are wondering how I came up with this particular K-probe, I did not. Uh, <laughs> I generally uh, rely on uh, kernel engineers who uh, know kernel very well and know exactly uh, where, uh, where to hook to, for example, observe uh, fire operations, because it turns out that there are many different uh, ways how we, the application can uh, actually write fa to files. Um, if you, like me, are not a kernel developer, then in the Tetragon repository there is a uh, quite big directory with examples of tracing policy for many, many different use cases uh, from security domain, but also uh, some networking use cases. So I invite you to uh, go to um, examples directory in, uh, in uh, Tetragon repository and browse this, uh, these examples. All right, so uh, if we load this policy to observe all file operations, you can imagine that uh, this, this would produce a lot of data because the applications are doing a lot of file operations. Applications developers don't that often need to think about it because a library is abstracted for us, but 
most applications are doing a ton of file operations all the time. So what do we do with all this data? And um, how, how uh, we generally approach uh, using eBPF for observability? Uh, the first step is to understand why we are using, even using eBPF for observability. And um, how, how it typically looks like. So most companies, when they are building their observability pipeline, they go through a few stages, and this is a very, very simplified view of this. But first, uh, when we first build applications, usually we don't put any instrumentation in there. And there's very good reason for that, because instrumentation is an additional overhead, and if code is evolving rapidly, then this overhead either slows us down or we just end up with very, very incorrect instrumentation, which is worse than no instrumentation because it is completely misleading to us. So this is, this is not bad that, yeah, we, we don't write in instrumentation from day one, but then um, oh, we also end up with painful incidents. Uh, and very often the second step is do something, go from nothing to something, from, from zero to one. And this step is usually a game changer. So there are plenty of tools now that provide uh, some sort of auto-instrumentation that provide out-of-the-box solution so that we are getting some visibility with one command, for example. Mm, and this is great. Um, this uh, already uh, allows us to troubleshoot incidents more easily while it's also, uh, it's still a low maintenance solution because we just installed something and we don't have to have the whole team actually maintaining it. And then there are probably a few other stages that I skipped on this slide. Uh, but at some point the, the uh, company has uh, actually mature observability platform, a team maintaining it, uh, some business specific instrumentation that allows teams to troubleshoot incidents efficiently. Um, however, usually there are many teams and many applications that are at different maturity levels, different stages of, of this whole journey. Um, and usually uh, we, we still uh, want to keep low overhead and maybe uh, in particular in mature uh, big organizations, we want to keep very low overhead because at scale it really adds up and uh, it adds up very quickly. So um, EVPF can help with uh, step one a lot uh, because we get no instrumentation and uh, many EVPF uh, so based solutions are uh, provide this out of the box experience that you just install something and you get um, the whole um, solution, uh, but it can also help with uh, immature organizations where um, there are many applications and this full visibility aspect of, of eBPF uh, really kicks off here that uh, it can see everything that is happening, uh, not only uh, applications that are well uh, instrumented, and we are getting low overhead with what matters a lot of scale. Um, many eBPF based tools are not really providing uh, something like, completely new that is impossible uh, for, with, with any other tools, but are providing uh, more efficient or easier to use, uh, easier to maintain uh, replacement. Uh, this is one example of this. Um, so with Tetragon, uh, we built some Grafana dashboards uh, for networking and security use cases, uh, which uh, this example is uh, showing the uh, TCP traffic. Um, this kind of data is also uh, possible to get with uh, built-in uh, C advisor metrics built into Kubernetes uh, and Kube Prometheus dashboard. With Tetragon in general, it's uh, Mm, it's likely uh, to be more efficient because uh, data is aggregated in, uh, in the kernel. Mm, but, um, and also we might get 
uh, we get extra information like the binary association. So uh, you might need it, you might not, uh, but probably it doesn't make sense to keep both of these tools, uh, which is common cause of, uh, of the overhead in the observability space that we just have so many tools that are duplicating each other. And, all right, the step two, um, what we want to observe, um, so uh, filtering. And I will show now a few examples of um, tetragon tracing policy that we uh, saw previously. So we saw this example with um, uh, file operations and um, the solution to, to like all the uh, fluid of data we, are, we would get with this uh, is to uh, filter by only some files. For example, here, um, something that security teams very like very much because this was made in, in, with security teams in mind, uh, filtering only writes to etc password. Uh, so uh, we can write configuration like that and uh, Tetragon will pass this configuration to the kernel. So the filtering actually happens in BPF programs, not in user space. This is what, what allows us to, um, to have this very, very low overhead because yeah, everything is happening in the kernel and only relevant events are pushed to user space. A second example is something that is pretty new. Uh, I think uh, part of it is still in, in pull request, but um, stack traces um, on crashes. So uh, we can hook into a function that, uh, that is called when application is segfaulting and uh, get stack trace for it. Um, Many, uh, many companies use some tools uh, that, um, that provide you, that parse or uh, collect all the errors for you and, um, and like, group them for you. Uh, however, uh, what uh, we, saw is, uh, we saw is very beneficial with EBPF is that it provides this extra layer of reliability and uh, when application is defaulting, this is something you, you really need to investigate. You really need this, uh, to have this information, these stack traces. So uh, this kind of policy can be used to provide this extra layer of uh, visibility, uh, of like reliability and uh, be passed, plugged in into some sort of uh, stack trace parser. Uh, next example is uh, external traffic. So uh, very often traffic in Kubernetes cluster is observed by, for example, a service mesh, but very often also external traffic is something that people care more about for various reasons. Um, we've worked uh, in with a few air-gapped environments where uh, people wanted to detect attempts to external traffic, to like external connections, not only even unsuccessful attempts, so not only like ongoing external traffic, which shouldn't be happening at all. Uh, cost monitoring is a big thing. External traffic, egress traffic usually costs more. Uh, cloud providers usually charge up uh, more up from, for it, so um, monitoring it to monitor cost is uh, usually important. And uh, SAS requests, uh, external SAS requests are uh, generally a uh, common uh, attack vector. Uh, tracing policy for this uh, looks like this. So uh, here we hook into TCP, uh, to function that's called when TCP packet is sent, but we filter by uh, cluster ciders. So um, we filter out all traffic that is going, uh, that is happening within pods and services ciders and localhost. So then, um, we will get events only from external traffic. And uh, just because I like showing the PF code on slides and to show that it's, the filtering is happening in kernel, this is actual code from Tetragon. You can uh, go on link in the slides and uh, see the full code. This is heavily truncated because yeah, it wouldn't fit on slide, but what is happening is that we, uh, we store this filter from tracing policy in a map and here you can see um, a uh, uh, map lookup which uh, compares the uh, address uh, that, that we are handling right now to the range in the map and um, 
decides if uh, we should get an event on this, um, do something on, the, on uh, this IP or not. Okay, and then last thing, uh, and maybe something that, that it's most, that we first think of when we want to reduce amount of data, uh, aggregation. So aggregation means metrics in general. Um, this is how metrics usually, uh, the, how metrics uh, flow works. So um, first co collect metrics, expose then um, in, um, in your metrics uh, solution, for example, Prometheus, uh, pull these metrics, store them somewhere and then query visualize. Uh, so the part on the right is usually Prometheus or uh, different stages there can be replaced by different, more efficient solutions. The part on the left is the instrumentation part. And usually it's thought of as one thing. Usually collect metrics and expose metrics is like one instrumentation, one library. However, we can separate these parts. We can, in particular, we can um, defer the collection part to EBPF. And how we do this? is uh, this is an example where we collect metrics um, per, so we want metrics with labels um, from with Kubernetes metadata, uh, because this has, gives us this high level context and this allows us to uh, associate events with, with like teams in the organization, for example. So uh, in the Tetragon agent, we watch pods, uh, this can be done with, Kate's, it, uh, with the Kate's, uh, by watching API server or container runtimes. We actually switched from API server to container runtimes at some point because of um, security reasons, but in general, like both of these are possible for, for observability tools. Uh, and then we pass this um, metadata we got uh, about the, the pods to, uh, to the kernel, to the, uh, we write them to the BPF map, uh, where we map container ID to Kubernetes metadata. The next uh, step is that we have BPF program and on every event when, where it's hooked, it gathers labels from this map and it updates metrics stored in another map. Um, and as simple as that, we in user space, uh, what we need to do, uh, this is again, a bit truncated code, but uh, the only thing that we need to do is um, read this metrics, iterate over this uh, metrics map to collect metric uh, with, for all the, um, uh, all the Kubernetes labels uh, and expose them with, uh, with Prometheus. Uh, all right, I think I'm out of time. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Do we have time for a question? Okay. If anybody has any questions, then yeah, feel free to uh, find me here or <laughs> anytime at the conference. Sorry. Quick question. I'm here, I'm here. Um, IPv6 support? Sorry? IPv6 support? Uh, do, do we support IPv6 with this? So, IPv6? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So uh, this code that yeah. for filtering I showed, yeah, actually one thing that I truncated there was IPv6 because it wouldn't fit on a slide, but yes, absolutely, we support IPv6, yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you for your talk. Sorry. <laughs> I have a question uh, about uh, eBPF. You uh, were showing uh, some C code. Yes. I played a bit with eBPF and I was wondering uh, if maybe someone is working, maybe you know, on uh, another language on top of it to maybe ma make it more mm -hmm. mainstream. 
could be you are, or uh, maybe uh, even uh, something I mean, of I, going. Or, yeah. Why is it C? Do you, do you know if some people are trying to also make eBPF available yeah. for yeah. no kernel developers? <laughs> <let's say. laughs> Thank yeah, you. so so it's C because kernel is written in C. Uh, I know that there are people writing some BPF code in Rust. Uh, I know it's a thing, but I haven't digged that much into it. So, yeah, okay. this this is another language. Thank I you. don't know it's it is possible. Okay. okay. Did you already take a look at the isobalance About what? <laughs> no, not at all. Because I think they have kind of transpiler from Go programs to ah. the CPF over okay. there, if I remember correctly. I wasn't aware so about it. Go to their web page and check out. Yeah, the please check them. <laughs> I, I think there's something. Hello. So do we have a bunch of uh, default uh, policies or uh, blueprints which companies who want to move to Tracagon can get for free or by default? Or is it like everything has to be created from scratch? For example, the example you showed where the ETCD uh, password, access, changing that is a warning alert. Like, do we get those things for free or is it like we have to create those rules ourselves? You have to create those rules yourself. You don't necessarily have to write them yourself. You can use uh, the examples directory in the uh, in the Tragon repository. So yeah, this is this is the current solution for this because writing these tracing policies is difficult for non-kernel developers. Uh, we all know this. So uh, the current solution for this is this like examples library, uh, which has documented policies for many different use cases. Uh, so you just take them and you apply them. Um, yeah, by default, like when you just install Tetragon and don't apply this configuration, you, I think we will get events uh, for process execution only. Uh, this is all done to ensure lower overhead. This is like the, the main goal of this, this decision that by default uh, you don't get like this, you know, events for things you are not interested in or things you monitor with other tools because um, Tetragon is often used with, with also other tools that you know, can duplicate this. So yeah, just you, the answer is like, use the examples. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to assume that there's also no a community driven rules like, like these rules are good for REST app, these, good, these rules are good for uh, Postgres application databases like there's no a community driven like we can look at like uh, so, certain uh, scenarios. Yeah, so I would say like this examples directory in Tetragon repository is is community driven. Uh, most of the examples at this point are security focused. Uh, there are not that many based uh, for monitoring for uh, user applications. So not that many applications. Uh, policies using uprobes, for example, but it's absolutely possible. Um, I guess mo most of them were written by you know, uh, kernel developers, not Postgres developers. Uh, and when you have rules for like um, monitoring specific user space application, then writing this rule always requires certain expertise, like knowledge of internals of the application. Uh, this is something we can't work it out really. So uh, yeah, it, it is uh, community driven. We would absolutely love to have like more examples from the community for specific applications, specific use cases. Thank you. Hi, congratulations for your presentation. Um, there are some integration uh, based in auto instrumentation for traces. There are some integration integration with OpenTelemetry, for example, uh, collect the data sent to OpenTelemetry and implement some kind of sampling, maybe head sampling or tail sampling. Mm -hmm. Because the volume of data, I, I imagine that uh, can be high. Yeah, so for, for distributed tracing specifically, right? Uh, the tools that I know about, um, they, they, I, I think you can, um, so open telemetry itself provides like auto instrumentation, but I think it doesn't have like built in uh, uh, EBPF based instrumentation. But as far as I know, you, 
there you yeah, can... Go language it. is instrumented uh, by open telemetry using the eBPF, for example. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how the something configuration looks, looks there, because I think um, I don't recall any sort of something happening actually in BPF there, but also I haven't looked in details that much, so, so maybe, because you can sample for sure, like somewhere in the pipeline, where, wherever you go, it won't, no. like you can sample it uh, when you collect the traces. Uh, the most efficient thing would be to sample um, in kernel so that you don't produce this trace pans, but I didn't see this happening, but yeah, m maybe. <laughs> I guess <laughs> the Grafana people would be good to ask about okay, it. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, uh, Dominique uh, from EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique Federal uh, of Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, mm -hmm. Congrats for your awesome presentation and uh, synthetical thinking. You were able to present a very complex topic uh, in a very clear and efficient fashion. Thank you very much for that. I've got a question uh, regarding, uh, so the, you know, you probably know of D-Trace. You probably remember of the D-Trace that had D-Trace, mm-hmm. That it's was the thing, thing that uh, did a, a bit like eBPF, but uh, with uh, no passive effect at all because it was able to mutate some code inside the kernel when the probe was active and then uh, remove itself when not. And there was a feature that was really interesting in that, which was that it had user space support. Uh, you could put uh, the very same kind of probes inside programs that didn't even consent to it. Is there an equivalent in EBPF uh, world? Do you have like a uh, libc eBPF or something like that? Mm, I mean, there are U probes, but honestly, I, uh, I don't know exactly how, how this uh, work in D-Trace, so not sure how, uh, so I, I don't know, sorry. All right, <laughs> I don't know uh, how, that's fine. Thank how, you. how close it is. You can answer this question, thank you. D-Trace <laughs> uh, 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 was used back in the past but had a higher overhead than uh, eBPF. So you can cover the tracing that you were able to do with the trace, with eBPF, with a lower overhead. So you, okay. you're saying that eBPF is even better than... Yes. It's better. It's a lower overhead. <laughs> Thank you.